Good morning, TWC fam! Happy Sunday, happy Sunday, happy Sunday! We made it in here to the first Sunday of October, and we are so grateful because you could have chosen anywhere else to worship, but you chose to be here today. So thank you, thank you, thank you. On behalf of Bishop Van Moody, his wife, my friend, Dr. Ty Moody, I am honored to share with you all today. Uh, to my husband, thank him for all of the prayers, the fasting, and the anointing. I tell you, it took a lot to get us to this morning, but we made it. Amen. Well, family, we have a grand question to answer today. That question is, why am I stuck? Before we get started, let's pray. Father, I thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Father God, for the hearts of your people. I pray that the word this morning not only penetrate my heart, but penetrate the hearts of everyone who's listening. I pray that you would give us spiritual eyes, spiritual ears to receive the word that you have for us today. Eliminate every distraction so that we can focus on you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So we are answering the question this morning, why am I stuck? Family, we're going to walk through the book of Jeremiah this morning to answer this question. Y'all ready? Yeah. All right, let's look at the scripture, Jeremiah chapter 25. We're going to start at verse 2, and I'm going to read through 11. We'll be skipping around a bit, so let's keep up. Verse 2, Jeremiah the prophet said to all the people in Judah and Jerusalem, for the past 23 years, from the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, until now, the Lord has been giving me his messages. I have faithfully passed them to you, but you have not listened. Verse 7 but you have not listened to me, says the Lord. You made me furious by worshiping idols with your own hands that you built, bringing on yourselves all the disasters that you now suffer. And now the Lord of heaven's army says, because you have not listened to me. Verse 10, I will take away your happy singing and laughter. The joyful voices of bridegrooms and brides will no longer be heard. Your millstones will fall silent. The lights in your homes will go out. This entire land will become a desolate wasteland. Israel and her neighboring lands will serve king of Babylon for 70 years. In other words, family, the people of Judah were stuck. They were stuck in Babylon for 70 years. And God says clearly, because you have not listened to me. I want to present to you this morning that this is just the cusp of why we may be stuck. We're going to delve into this a little bit more. I want you to imagine a time, or maybe it's you right now, where people are laughing, fun is happening, but you, you're irritated. What about when your friend buys a home, or somebody gets married that you're close to, or a great thing happens to somebody, but you, you bitter. What about when great things happen to your family, your children, your grandchildren, but for some reason, you can't celebrate with them? 
and your heart and your mind, you are simply unmoved. Could it be that you're stuck? Could it be that what you are experiencing is a moment in time where you are stuck and you don't know what to do about it? Why are we stuck? Let me ask you this, fam, and you might think it's too early for this, but it's, I think it's time. How's your home life? Don't answer it out loud. <laughs> you might think, boy, she's trying to really get into my business early this morning, but what I'm trying to tell you is I am literally walking the line of Scripture. Because if we go back to verse 10, it says that your millstones will fall silent. Let me describe to you this morning what a millstone is. A millstone is a large round stone. Back in the biblical days, they used millstones to grind the grain. That grain family is what fed the Israelites in biblical days. So if there was no grinding of grain and the millstones were silent, may I submit to you that the home life wasn't that good. They're probably hungry. Then the scripture goes on to say in verse 10 that the light will be off in the home. <laughs> now, see, I work at the VA. And at the VA, we try to pinch pennies. And so we have lights that are motion sensor. It never fails that every time there is no movement in the space that I'm working in, when I'm with the patient, the lights go out. And you know what always happens? The patient will say, uh-oh. <laughs> Somebody didn't pay the bill. And I'm like, no, your taxpayer dollars are at work. This is a motion sensor light. So when there is no movement, when we are stuck in a space, the lights go out. I'm going to ask you again. I still don't want you to answer out loud. How's your home life? See, now you see, it's not personal. I'm just following the scripture. So we can all breathe because if the conversations with your spouse at home are sticky, if your children are acting out of order, are your bills getting paid? What's happening in your home? Are you stuck? Where's the movement this morning? How's your home life? Why in the world did the people of Israelite get stuck in the first place? Y'all, the big picture here is idolatry. Let's take a look at scripture on this. Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. It says, has anyone ever heard of anything as strange as this? Has any nation ever traded its own gods for new ones, even though those gods are not even gods at all? <laughs> Yet my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. The heavens are shocked at such a thing, and they shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord. Go over to chapter 25. Verse 7 in Jeremiah says, But you would not listen to me, says the Lord. You made me furious by worshiping idols that you made with your own hands, bringing on yourself all the disasters that you now suffer. Stuck. You see, the people of Judah were putting their trust and pagan gods 
over and over again, gods that they built with their own hands trying to worship and put time and belief and energy into this idol and then make it so bad that idol didn't work, they would go over to this idol and they would say, oh, I worship you. Oh, I praise you. Give me what I need and still come up empty. They were going from idol to idol, idol to idol, pagan to pagan and coming up empty. Family, this is insane. Why would you do the same thing over and over again? and expect to get something different. Impossible. The people of Judah were stuck. and They continued to come up empty because they were worshiping idols. Now I want y'all to think back to elementary school. You remember when we learned about a noun? A noun is a person, a place, a thing, and don't forget, I thought our idea. So, any noun that we worship, any noun that we put above God, any person, any place, anything, any thought, any idea that we put above God is perhaps an idol. What are you putting your energy into today? You see, that's what's tricky about idolatry. Idolatry is one of those things, it can creep up on you. Because see, idolatry can be your spouse. Idolatry can be your children. Idolatry can be grandchildren. It can be your job. It can be cars, houses, money. Idolatry can show up anywhere. But we don't recognize it as idolatry because we go from pagan to pagan to pagan to pagan and we're wondering why we're stuck. Idolatry can show up in our thoughts. What exactly are you searching for? Some of us searching for love. Where is the love? Where is the love? We're looking, we've put so much energy into finding the right person. We've skipped prayer, we've skipped reading the Bible, we've skipped asking God for love. So I ask you, why may you be stuck this morning? What may you be putting ahead of God this morning? What about pursuit? We don't think about that either. Pursuit of being like somebody else. Social media does not make this easy because everybody puts the best picture up on their profile. Everybody is watching all the ticks on the talk. Everybody is trying to pick up on the nearest trend in pursuit to be like someone else. We can put so much time, so much energy into this pursuit that we lose our relationship and connection with God. You see, really, that's what the people of Judah struggle with. They were trying to worship the pagan idols just like their neighbors. Old folks might say, oh, they just trying to keep up with the Joneses. Can't pay the bills. <laughs> Our insecurities this morning could have us stuck. Insecurities will make you pursue being like the neighbors instead of holding on to the confidence of who God created you to be. Everything that we are, everything that we have, everything that we want to become, God is the source. God is the source. God is the source. A 
Otherwise, every other source will lead to self-destruction. That's what the word says. You brought the destruction on yourself, Israel. So, how do we get away? How do we get out of this idolatry? idolatry? How do we get unstuck from this idolatry? Well, you got to make sure God is first in your life. You have to acknowledge that God is first. Let me ask you another question. When something goes wrong in your life, something fails, breaks, like maybe like maybe like a Eliminate every distraction, Father. All right. Yeah. Hey, I, I don't think the enemy wants y'all to hear this word. This morning. Anyway, I'm going to go back to my question, okay? So, so what if something wrong happens in your life, okay? An appliance stops working, okay? You make a mistake at your job. Something happens to your children. What is your first response? Is your first response to fix it? Or is your first response to pray? Because if your first response is to fix it, you might be your own idol. You just might be your own idol idol. So we have to acknowledge that God is our source for everything. We must understand that we are nothing without God. We are nothing apart from God. God is our source. Look at the word on this, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need. Plenty, a plethora left over. And you can even share with others when you go to the right source. How about Romans chapter 11, verse 36? For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. God is our source. So we've established that God is our source. Why do we cheat on them? Why do we step out on God? I think we're not devoted to God. I think that we have misplaced our loyalty. We are loyal to get the kids to school. We are loyal to make all our engagements for work. We are loyal to make our engagements for the football game. We are loyal to make our engagement with our friends. But when it comes time to engage with the Lord, our devotion may have just been misplaced. We step out. 
You know, I think of our four-year-old child. Y'all know what? Screen time. It's both a blessing and a curse, isn't it? We can get so much done with screen time. But don't let the screen or the battery go out on my four-year-old's tablet. <laughs> Y'all, when I tell you the world has ended, But when she gets it together, y'all, she will grab that cord, take that cord over to the outlet, plug the tablet into the outlet because she knows good and well the source of the power comes from the outlet. What am I trying to tell you this morning? Some of you all got dead faith and you need to take the plug and put it into the outlet. You got to go back to the source. Our faith needs to be revived. If a four-year-old knows where the power comes from, we ought to be able to stand up and plug in. God is the source. Somebody ought to start acknowledging God as the source. So, we get mixed up, but God's grace is so good, y'all. Even when we forget our source, he'll send us a word. He'll send us a word. He'll send us a word through people. He'll send us a word through a song. He'll send us a word in a dream. God will send us a word. But the question is, are you listening? You see, another reason why we're stuck is because we do not listen. We are simply disobedient. God sent Jeremiah as a messenger. That's what the whole book of Jeremiah is about. He's weeping, he's crying, he's shouting, he's screaming, please, would you just listen to me? They ain't listening, y'all. Look at Jeremiah chapter six. Let's start at verse 16. Put some scripture on this thing. This is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads, look around, ask for the old godly way, and then walk in it. Did y'all see that instruction? Did they listen? Okay. Travel its path, and you will find rest for your souls. But look what you reply. No, that's not the road we want. Then God says, well, I posted a watchman over you who said, listen for the sound of the alarm. But you replied, no, we won't pay that any attention. Therefore, listen to this. All you nations, take note of my people's situation. Listen, all the earth, I will bring disaster on my people. It is the fruit of their own schemes because they refuse to, to me. They have rejected my word. Family, more times than not, we find ourselves stuck because we didn't listen. And if we heard it, we didn't obey. Research demonstrates that 70% of our waking time, we are in some form of communication, 70%. 2% is spent writing. Y'all know we don't write anymore, we, we do this now. Do y'all's thumbs hurt sometimes? 15% reading, 32% talking and jabbing, and 42 to 57% or more 
of our time is spent hearing things. Notice I said, <laughs> somebody paying attention. Hearing things, 60% of our day hearing things, but hearing something and actively listening is totally different. In fact, some of y'all may have tapped out this morning when you realized Bishop Moody was not on the stage. And you know what? It's okay. He's my pastor too, y'all. I love my pastor. But the point is, we are not truly listening. When we hear things, are we truly processing what is going in? I want to share another report or article with you all. Now, this is from Deseret News. And they actually polled Americans and British people about the Ten Commandments. Now, the question here that you all will see on the screen is, what commandment is least important to you? Guess what American answered? The Sabbath day. 50% or more says that that's the least important commandment. Who needs time with the Lord, they say. Could it be that we don't listen to God because we don't value time with God? And if we don't value time with God, how can we truly hear God? Are you listening? Are you truly listening? You see, society will make this really difficult, but the word will make this really simple. God says, I just want your time. I just want your time. What have we lost because we won't sit with the Lord? When we say no because I'm sleepy, God, no because that doesn't make sense to me, God, no because I have other things to do right now, God, no because that commitment is too long, what does God think of that? No. Let me tell you what he thinks. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 24. God says, but my people would not listen to me. They kept doing whatever they wanted, following the stubborn desires of their evil hearts, and they went backward instead of forward. So when we say no, we already stuck. God says, they step backwards. That's worse than being stuck. When we were stuck, at least we were up here. But the no keeps us from really connecting with God. God doesn't want us to move backward. God doesn't want us to be stuck. He wants us moving forward. What have we lost because we've been moving in the wrong direction? What have we paid for unnecessarily because we said no instead of yes? What pain have we lived through or endured because we said no? Just make time for God. He's been talking to us all along. He's been connecting with us all along, but we are not tapped in. Lastly, family, we are stuck because we have no 
remorse. We don't have any remorse. We are living in a time today where we will go out, do the wrong thing over and over again, and we are not sorry. No apologies, no remorse about what we have done. In fact, we'll play it on God. Well, God know my heart. No remorse, but you wonder why you are still in the same space. God says in his word, Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 10, he said, Judah has never sincerely returned to me. Y'all check this out. She has only pretended. <laughs> she has only pretended to be sorry. No remorse, no sorrow, no guilt for doing the wrong thing. Too many of us believers, we are walking outside of these four doors and we are acting brand new. Not like Christians at all. What are people coming to you with? Are they coming to you for prayer? Are they coming to you for direction? Or are they coming to you with mess and destruction? Now I'm going to let you sit on that. Because I want you to think about last week. Because next week y'all going to do better. Y'all going to do better. What are they coming to you with? That's a real reflection of where you are. I want us to stop pretending. I want us to really take heed and believe God for the promises that he set forth in our life. Even when we look at that same scripture, we see the word return, return, return and walk to Jesus, return and walk to Jesus, Re turn and walk to Jesus. Do you get what I'm saying? When you say return and walk to Jesus, that's the definition of repentance. When you turn around and you take the steps in the other direction, you are repenting. God said, stop it, stop it, stop pretending. Come back to me return to me father God says turn around go towards Jesus so you say okay repent I got it but I don't really know how to do that I don't really know how to repent well first you got to confess your sin Tell God what you did wrong. He's here to listen to you. Look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. It reads, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful. He is just to forgive us of our sin. And y'all, the Lord doesn't stop there. It says he will cleanse us of all wickedness, every speck, every spot gone. Next, turn away, turn and walk toward Jesus. Stop pretending to be right and really do right. If you look at Ezekiel chapter 18 at the latter part of verse 30, it says, repent and turn from your sins. Don't let them destroy you. After all, that's what happened to the people of Judah. 
That's what God is saying. I don't want you to do this. Turn around and repent. And then lastly, we got to thank God for the forgiveness that he has provided. Thank God for the cleansing. Thank God for the renewal. Thank God for the restoration. Thank God for the deliverance. Look at Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 34. It said, you should know the Lord for everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already. And I will forgive their wickedness. And I will never again remember their sins. Amen. But y'all, it doesn't stop there. We go over to the New Testament. In the book of Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 and 12, it says, But this is the new covenant, which is where you and I lived in today. And I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people, and I will forgive their wickedness. I will never again remember their sins. Listen, family, God does not want you to be stuck. There was a time in my life where I was stuck. I was stuck in a cycle of abusive relationships. I would go from one man to the next, different men, same abuse, no deliverance. You know why I wasn't delivered in that moment? I never repented. I never stood before God and said, Lord, I have put these men in relationships before you. It wasn't until I got to that moment, stripped down with the Lord to say, I am sorry. Deliver me, Father. I am stuck in this cycle and I don't want to be stuck anymore. I had to face confession. I had to forgive. I had to forgive the manipulation. I had to forgive the jealousy. I had to forgive the wounds. And I had to forgive myself. Some of you all this morning are stuck because you're stuck in your pain. You've refused to move forward because you can't see no other way. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God has a way out. And it starts with repentance and forgiveness. Now, a good therapist will tell you forgiveness is two parts. First, you got to forgive the facts. It happened. Whatever it was, it happened. You got to forgive the facts, but then you got to forgive the impacts. You see, impact is what we live in after the fact. Impacts can go on for years and years after the offense. Impacts happen when a trigger pops up and you don't know what to do, but you are furious, you are frustrated, and you are hurt. You got to forgive the impact. That's what so many people are not teaching. People are trying to understand, well, I've forgiven. I've been there. I've done that. Why do I still feel this way? Because you haven't addressed the impact. And I want you to know that the blood of Jesus is greater than any trigger, than any impact that you have experienced. The Bible says that he will wash away every sin, every speck of unrighteousness. You are pure by the red blood of Jesus has made you white as snow. What are you living out of today? Your cycle might not be abuse or men. Your cycle might be an irritating spouse. Your cycle might be children that just ain't doing right. 
Maybe you were bullied on your job. Maybe you were bullied at school. Maybe you were hurt by your family, siblings, aunts, uncles, parents. I don't know your story, but you do. There's deliverance for you today. I want you to be honest this morning and stand with me if this message touched your heart because we're gonna go through a prayer of repentance. So if you will hold your hands up, receiving your forgiveness from God, and just repeat this prayer after me. Lord, I am tired of being stuck. I know that I've done wrong. I have put my pain above you. I have not listened to you. And I am sorry. I repent for not putting you first. Forgive me, Lord. I've been hurt, violated, and frustrated. I forgive the people who hurt me. And when I still get upset, I believe the blood of Jesus is greater than the truth.